Ziegler, a three from the deep left wing is short. Rebounded by Fletcher Lawyer. Tennessee will not foul. And wouldn't you know it, on Resurrection Sunday, the Purdue Boilermakers have turned the doubters into believers. Believe this, for the first time since 1980, Purdue is headed back to the Final Four. McCain throwing it up to the rim, missed the shot, and it's all over. It's all over. Tsunami. And that tsunami is headed to Phoenix, Arizona for the final four. Final score 76 64. The Wolf Pack beats Duke. You can light up the bell tower red. The pack is back in the national semifinals for the first time since 1983. Pretty amazing stuff. NC State is your Cinderella, but they are red hot, and they were a team that was not going to make this tournament. Had to hit a bank in three to force overtime in ACC tournament semifinals against Virginia, and they eventually won the tournament to get the automatic bid. Five games they won in five days. Beat Duke, beat North Carolina, beat Virginia. Going to NCAA tournament, you're thinking they're probably going to be a little bit worn out. I had them losing first round to Texas Tech. And all the way to the Final Four, I did not think they were going to beat Duke. I thought the path was perfect for Duke, and then they beat Duke for the second straight time. They beat Duke in the ACC tournament. So welcome to the Sports Ticket, brought to you by Kiefer Brothers Automotive in Beloit. Your home for fast, friendly auto repair. A lot to cover here, NCAA tournament, the men and women's tournament. Uh, the Royals break up the Royals. They got their first win yesterday and scored a lot of runs, which probably means they're going to get shut out today. And... Uh, a Chiefs wide receiver that could be in trouble with the law. We'll discuss that in society in general when we get to that part of the show. That's all coming up here in just a little bit. Quick, uh, we, we go to Dusty for some local sports. Yeah, not a lot going on today, but uh, you can find the full spring sports schedule at nckssports.com. The Concordia baseball and softball teams have doubleheaders with Sacred Heart on the schedule today at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, again, more uh, teams will be in action tomorrow, and we hope to uh, maybe talk with some coaches today that we might preview some things tomorrow with uh coming up here in spring sports action so track and field a lot of teams will be out there uh tomorrow as well so again nckssports.com is your home for the latest local sports schedules and results uh, from uh, the spring sports season here all right on saturday uconn and illinois played and it was a tight hard-fought grinder of a game it was 23 to 23 and UConn hits you with the super normal, always you see it, 30 to nothing run. That's right, 30 unanswered to go up 53 23 in the Elite Eight against the 10th ranked team in the country, according to the polls. And I got to thinking, I've coached youth basketball, and I think, I think I've seen a couple of 30 0 runs. Mm-hmm. And not even youth basketball, you have 30 0 runs. This is the Elite Eight. It's a regional final. And UConn just destroyed Illinois. It was insane to watch. And if they play like that, there is nobody that's going to touch this team in the Final Four. In Phoenix, Alabama beat Clemson 89-82. They're down 13 in the first half. Came back. They hit 16 of 36 threes. Marquette was 4 of 31 from 3 in a Sweet 16. Got bounced. Alabama hits 16 of 36. They're going to the Final Four. There is so much reliance on the three point shot. It is insane. Like, just, I think you can, it's pretty, for them, usually, not always, there's an exception to the rules. Tennessee won a game against Texas. They were three of 25 from three. But if you go to just one stat, that's it. Don't worry about all the other stats. Just go to three point attempts, three point makes, compare the two box scores, and you have a pretty good idea who's going to win. Not always. I mean, Kansas yeah. was outscored uh, by 30 and three-pointers by Sanford, and they won 93-89. But the only way that you win uh, by shooting poorly from the three-point line is the other team shoots severely poorly from the three-point line. And the only way you get beat if you shoot really well from the three-point line is if the other team shoots a ton of free throws and usually has a big man, mm. which would be a Purdue, which could be an NC State. But Alabama's going to the Final Four for the first time in school history. And they'll take on UConn. Uh, I don't know. Do you think Alabama has much of a chance in that game? I mean, I don't Not think anybody's going to give them a chance. the things are going right now. I don't think anybody's going to give them a chance. Yeah. But if they make a ton of threes, it's always possible. I, I, I said before the Elite Eight started that the only team that can beat UConn is Purdue. And Purdue is in as they knocked off Tennessee yesterday. Zach Eady was sensational. He had 40 points. Dalton Connect had 37 
which was pretty amazing as well. But Purdue wins 72-66. to 66. I had them winning it all in my bracket. By the way, how are we doing on the bracket contest? I have. Dusty doesn't care because he's not doing so well. I'm actually moved I've got up two, in the the rankings. Uh, I've, got the four, I've got two of my four. I got two of the four right. You're course. actually in third. I believe. No, you're in second. Actually. Oh yeah, I'm ahead um, of my I'm ahead of my ten year old now. I know that. Chloe has won this thing before, and she's in first place right now. Okay. Um, Who did she pick to win it all? UConn. UConn. So okay. it's you know basically it's between come down you to two, Purdue. it's UConn and Purdue. Yeah. So yeah, if, if Purdue beats UConn, I've UConn the final four. I had them losing North Carolina, so I'm not going to get one there. But if Purdue wins the next two, I'll I'll, that'll help, obviously. Yeah, everybody that would even be close to the top that would have a chance mm-hmm. has UConn, so that would knock them out if they're under Chloe right right, right now. So right. Uh, she's the only one with UConn that could win okay. uh, this thing. And Where's uh, my boys at? Where are they at? They, they took a little hit here oh, in the yeah. second week, for sure. My oldest definitely um, did. I'm now 11th, which, okay. which is better than the middle now. Your wife is middle of the pack, 15. Uh, your youngest is 18th. And your oldest is in 20th. That's interesting because they're both behind my wife, but they both picked more winners. It's your point system that you do on that. Absolutely. Because we just go wins and losses. And and my oldest and my youngest of four more wins than my my wife. So by far, they're better if you go one by one. (laughs) But it is kind of cool if you Elevated point system. Yeah. Elevated point system, which helps me in the situation with Purdue and UConn. So, uh, yeah, that's the best I've ever done. I, I I've never come even close to winning this thing. Chalk is still in third place Chalk's right now. Chalk's in third. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if Purdue and UConn win in the Final Four, then Chalk might – Chalk will go up. Yeah. Chalk will be ahead of me. Um, NC State beat Duke. I didn't see that coming. I, I mean, I thought Duke was going to end the run. And Duke, of course, the horrible thing was Houston and Jamal Shedd getting hurt and not being able to play in the in the – well, he missed the last. What was he? he played the first thirteen minutes? They're up six, and that was the heart and soul of their team. And they still almost won. So NC State beat Duke, and NC State's in. So eleven of four and two ones, and nobody in these brackets had Alabama. I don't think, and nobody had eleven seed in NC State. That's for sure. Everybody, most people that I saw, and and even myself, was like, you know, it's a cool run there by NC yep. State in the ACC tournament, but it's going to come to an end pretty fast, and it did not. No, it's pretty. <laughs> it, it's fun. I mean, I it's like, like that UConn run, right, where they yeah. won the Big East. And and then just won every game after right. that. I don't know that NC State's going to do that. No, but, uh, UConn was a six seed that year in the tournament. Yeah, um, but DJ Burns played great. He had twenty nine yesterday. He's a big, wide body, but he's very athletic. And NC State's playing the best ball of the year. They peaked at the right time. That's what it is. It's about playing your best when you get into the tournament. And Purdue and NC State, that's the first Final Four game coming up on Saturday on TBS. That's right. You have to watch TBS to watch it, not CBS. 509 is our, our time, the opening tip. I don't see NC State. I didn't see NC State making this run. I didn't see NC State beating Duke. I do not see NC State beating Purdue. The only thing is they are playing with house money. They'll be loose as a goose. Purdue's going to be – I think Purdue's going to be loose too, though. Here's the thing. Purdue's won to get to Final Four, first time since 1980. They've had some really, really good teams. And they've never made it to the Elite Eight under Matt Painter. Now they're there. And I think the monkey's off their back. And I look back to 2008. Kansas, Bill Self had lost a lot of Elite Eight games at Illinois. He lost one at Tulsa, lost at Illinois. He had lost at Kansas in Elite Eight games before. And when Steph Curry passed the ball and the Davidson kid missed it wide right or wide left, whatever it was, you could just see the, the relief on Bill Self's face. Now, granted, Kansas then went to a Final Four where there was four number one seeds, and they were probably the lowest of the four. And Kansas absolutely played terrific for the most part. They were down most of the championship game to uh, Memphis, but they blew the, the the doors off North Carolina. They just played loose, and there's you know, we know Bill Self in his book after all that said, "Hey, we were we were just the monkey was off our back. We we just played loose. Like now you can get there, you can relax. The toughest game to win is the Elite Eight. Bill Self said that many coaches said the toughest game to win is the Elite Eight game because you want to get there so badly. And then once you're there, you're like you take it all in, you absorb it, and you're just there and you play ball. And I think Purdue is in that spot where they're just, hallelujah, we finally broke through, we're going, and wouldn't it be something that the second, the, 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 there's only been two teams that have lost to a 16, 
as a one in the NCAA tournament and Purdue's two wins away from making it two for two for the following year, that one seed wins it all. Virginia lost to UMBC the very next year, won it all. Purdue lost to Fairleigh Dickinson last year. They're two wins away from winning it all. So I don't see NC State beating Purdue because I think Burns is negated with Zach Eady at seven foot four. My oldest son says true, but Burns could probably push him out on the block because of his girth and this and that. I'm like, yeah, but I think there's going to be foul trouble issues here uh, for Burns. So I like Purdue a lot. I liked him before the tournament. I like him a lot in this matchup. And I think if they were the heavy, and I know they're a heavy favorite in this game. I get it. But they're not the favorite to win it all. So there's not that pressure. UConn's got the pressure of winning it all. I mean, there's everybody in America is basically going to tell you it's going to take a perfect game to beat UConn, which is bull. It won't take a perfect game to beat UConn, but that's what the narrative is going to be because they had a 30-0 run and blah, blah, blah. UConn's the one has got all the pressure in the world on them because they're expected to win this thing. Nobody's telling you that Purdue is going to, is expected to win it. Not with UConn in the field. Now, most years you'd say it's 50-50, not so much. I believe the only team that can beat UConn that's left is Purdue. So I'm cheering for Purdue to win because I think UConn's going to be Alabama. And we got Purdue-UConn, and I think that would be the best game in the national championship as well. Uh, and then you'd have 7'2 Klingon versus 7'4 Edie. So that's the bad thing about Purdue. If you think all these games, Purdue has an advantage with Edie inside. Against Connecticut, they probably won't. Yeah. And in that case, I would probably still go with you Connecticut matchup head-to-head. But it's so hard to repeat. Hasn't been done since 07. Of course, the Chiefs repeated for the first time in 20 years in the National Football League. It's hard to repeat in any sport, except the NBA seems to be a little bit easier over the years. But it is hard to repeat, and especially in a one-and-done situation like the NCAA tournament. So the odds are still against UConn, even though people are going to sit here and go, well, they've dominated, they've been up 30 in every game, nobody's going to touch them. I've seen this before. I've seen UNLV steamroll people. And nobody gave Duke a chance in the national semifinals. UNLV had steamrolled Duke the year before. And and Duke had the game plan. Now, there's not going to be a rematch in this situation from a tournament game yeah. the year before. But everybody they already know- had the rematch, and they dominated it. UConn. <laughs> What rematch? San Diego State from the oh, national yeah, championship yeah. last well, year. Yeah, I'm they, talking about the teams that yeah. are still alive. Yeah. But so, so when you look at the history, you're, so you're sitting here and you're going, I remember everybody in the world picked UNLV to win it. And they were dominant in the tournament. And I remember everybody in the world picked Kentucky undefeated. Automatic. Kansas, 34-1. and one, Their only loss in double overtime, Missouri, 1997. Automatic. None of those teams won it. And to me, this is the trap that people are going to fall into. And it's a lazy, easy take to have. And you could very easily be right with this. I don't know if I say a lazy take, but it's a not thinking it through. It's just an automatic, oh my God, they went on a 30 to nothing run, which adds to their legacy. It adds to the aura. And by the way, my oldest son, I just had to shut him down when he said this. He goes, you know what? I do think UConn could be the NBA team. I said, shut the hell up. <laughs> First of all, that is the people that say that stuff, it is just to get people to click on crap. That is so insulting to professional players. That is such a load of bull crap. Okay? Listen, UConn goes up against the Detroit Pistons or the Washington Wizards. They're not going to beat them. Okay? That's not going to happen. It will not happen. First of all, it'll be more, f- and they're going to be playing NBA rules, okay? Because that's what you need to do. If you're going to beat the pros, you have to play their rules, all right? So you're going to play eight more minutes of basketball, first of all. See, people don't think these things through. You're going to play another eight minutes, and the physicality of the pros is way more than college. Well, not way more, but it is usually. Uh, the guy, athletes are bigger, stronger, faster, even than the ones you get in college now. I know UConn has some guys that can play in the NBA. I get that. And I'm sitting here, and my oldest son says, yeah, well, look what they did to Illinois. I said, N- how many NBA players play for Illinois right now? Name more than one. Yeah. Because Shannon is. But after that, I don't know if there there probably be a couple might make a roster. That's not a bona fide juggernaut, Illinois. They're not full of NBA players. Okay, the Kansas team in 1997 was full. Their whole starting five played in the NBA. Was that a team that was going to go beat NBA team in 1997? No, I would have never said that. You know what they did? They won. They went better. They had a better record than UConn has now. UConn's lost three games this year. They lost by 19 to, to Creighton. They lost to Kansas. They they're not invincible. 
but they look like it because they're up 30 in every one of these games. And you know what that's all about? Matchups. Yeah. It's about matchups. Illinois didn't have a Illinois first of all had a horrible game plan going up against seven two guy. They didn't know how to stop short and take a little float or a jump shot. They went too deep. They got the shot rejected. They got intimidated, and they couldn't do anything offensively. So what made Connecticut so impressive defensively was what? 7-2 inside. Well, Purdue has 7-4 inside. So that changes some things. But I'm sitting here, I'm like, ooh, you know, my son fell into the dribble that is the national people talking, saying that UConn would beat an NBA team. And that's horse crap. They're, they're, they're not beat an NBA team. Until they beat a college team that has five first-round NBA picks, they're not beating an NBA team. They are not. It is so insulting and it's ridiculous that you think that five guys from college that have played together for just one for 40 games is going to go beat an NBA team that's played together for 80. It's insane. It's insulting and it's stupid. Okay. There is a difference in level of play. And by the way, I would I would I, I don't even entertain this if they're 40 and 0 like Kentucky was. You know, Kentucky would have had way more of a chance to be an NBA team than this UConn team. Kentucky had first oh, round yeah. picks galore. They had fed guys on the bench that were first round picks, and Kentucky was 40 and 0 one year. They didn't lose anybody. UConn hasn't even I mean, how do you beat an NBA team when you can't beat everybody on the college schedule? So, I'm sitting here and I'm going, "Stop it." Just stop it. Just There's no need to... This is a separate sport. It's the same thing when you start going, Caitlin Clark's better than any man that ever played the game because she scored more points. That's stupid. Just leave it in its own driveway, okay? Women's basketball is its own sport, and, and it's, it's growing, and Caitlin Clark is amazing. She's the best player in college basketball, all right? You can argue that if you want, but the bottom line is that's women's basketball. The men's game and the women's game are different. So then when you start sitting here and telling me that Caitlin Clark is the all-time lean scorer of all time in any sport, and then you start to argue about Pistol Pete, it isn't arguable, okay? First of all, Pistol Pete didn't have a three-point line. Caitlin Clark does. The men's college line is deeper than the women's college line, okay? So forth and so on. So they're separate sports. So when you start sitting here going, well, I think uh, Alabama could beat, uh, could beat uh, an expansion football team in the NFL. Well, I think that Connecticut could beat an NBA team, or they could beat some NBA teams. And that's even more insulting. Now you're implying that they can beat more than one. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm like, not even the 40 no Kentucky team I ever bought that crap. But here, you're sitting here acting like UConn is undefeated, having the most magical season that's ever been put together in the history of college basketball. And that's not even true. Are they having one of the best runs in the NCAA tournament? Yes, they are. But let's look at who they played. Where's the bracket? UConn played Stetson. Oh my. Northwestern, not average team out of the Big Ten. Okay, 21 and 11. They beat San Diego State, who wasn't even close to the team they were last year. No. Okay, and honestly, the, the one that stands out, of course, is Illinois because they went on a 30 to nothing run. They had 10 minutes of basketball where they were unbeatable, and that's true. In ten minute, that ten minute span, nobody in college basketball is going to hold a candle to them. Nobody. But what happens if Purdue puts together their best ten minutes of basketball of all time? It can happen. Yeah. Everybody has their stretch. I mean, NC State. Nobody thought they'd be here, and they are. So it's just so insulting to me when people throw this out there and say, "Well, Connecticut could be an NBA team." Well, first of all, I'll bet you a hundred bucks that the people that say that haven't watched much NBA. Secondly, they haven't watched the worst teams in the NBA yeah. because they don't pay attention to the worst teams. They watch the Lakers. They watch Steph and the Warriors. They watch the Celtics and Jason Tatum. They don't know. They can't even name a player that's on the Wizards or the Detroit Pistons because that's the. Listen, if you're sitting here telling me UConn's going to be NBA team. You got to start with the worst NBA teams. Yeah. You ain't going to just jump up and beat the Nuggets. <laughs> Don't you find that so insulting? I, I've never, I've never entertained any of Me that. Me like the back, the, you know, back when it's I was amazing in college, people buy into it. Back when I was in college, Miami had a really, really good football team, yeah. and they literally had like a ESPN promo commercial that was running that was saying Miami could beat the Bengals, and I'm like, <sighs> no, nah, dude. It, no, dude, it's not the same thing. It's not the same stuff. Now, listen, I think Miami would be a good 
comparison to what you were talking about with Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Like Miami had a ton of NFL players on that team. And, you know, that was the year that they actually won it Mm -hmm. and and won the championship. And, and, you know, because they lost to Ohio State in a game they probably should have won. And they didn't even beat the team. They didn't even run the table in college. They didn't even beat the team the year before in college, right? And and so, uh, you know, it's their, I guess, be the year after that. But uh, it was like, no, I've never bought into any of that. There's something that I was thinking that we're probably going to talk about in a little bit, that there are some junior college <laughs> men's teams that could beat like the lower-level D1 teams. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that because no, I've that. seen it in person. No, I what, agree with that. If you're at the top talent level. Oh, sure. And the, t- the ta- talent that I saw on Saturday, it's like some of these teams could beat some of those teams that are at the bottom sure. of like the Colonial or something. But I'm not, I'm not going to say that. But there's any 365 team, exactly. Division one teams. I'm going to say that any college team can beat one of 30 professional teams, which, by the way, have to have a cycle of guys that get on to that roster through another development, right. developmental group before and in between college and the NBA for some of those kids. Got to get through the G League first and then get to the pro team. Right. And so... This is what we were talking about the other day. It's like the the level of talent and skill at that at the NBA level right right now is insane. Oh, and yeah. it's like there's no you would have to you maybe if you collectively group the last five Connecticut teams and put the best players from those teams on there, they yeah. might be able to compete. Maybe. But not just one team from one year in college basketball is going to beat the worst team in the NBA. I'll never believe it. I remember the narrative before K-State played Oklahoma in the Big uh, 12 championship game in 03. I remember the narrative. That was a game that K-State won 35-7. to I was there for it. Uh, Darren Sproles, Il Roberson. And the whole narrative going into that game was Oklahoma – are they the best college football team ever? Yeah. And there was also a sub-narrative, and I remember it. Oklahoma's good enough to beat an NFL team. Well, that means K-State was good enough to beat an NFL team because State, <laughs> K-State kicked their butt, and Oklahoma still got their way into the BCS title game. 35-7. to seven. So when people start praising you and heaping up all the stuff, the laboratory, you're unbeatable, you're invincible, nobody can touch you, that's when the rude awakening occurs. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I still very still very, very I still feel very, very good that I didn't pick UConn. I'm not saying that I'm gonna be right, I don't know. Uh, and if UConn wins it all and they dominate, then you know what? You gotta put that up there with one of the best runs in the NCAA tournament history. No question. It can be discussed and debated. Was that the best run? And, of course, all the, the, the young people and people who just started watching the tournament this year are going to say that. And they're going to forget about a run that happened 18 years ago or whatever it might be. That's just the recency bias that you have. But UConn, are they legitimate? Oh, well, heck yeah, but Purdue's legitimate too. I just don't think Alabama has a good chance of beating UConn unless they hit 23s. And NC State, I don't think, beats UConn. So if you if, if I think Alabama is going to lose to UConn, then I want the best possible matchup in the national title game, and that's Purdue versus UConn. Two ones, a 7-4 guy versus 7-2 guy. And then and, and let the chips fall where they may. Because those, honestly, those two teams, in my opinion, have been the best two all year. I know a lot of people have thrown Houston in there. I have, not, I have not bought into Houston. You know that. I said this last Friday. Granted, they had a horrible break when Jamal yeah. Shedd had a sprained ankle. But it wasn't like they had 16 points with six minutes to go. They weren't lighting the world on fire offensively. But they're, they're a grinding type of team, low scoring. I don't think Houston would have beat a UConn because they don't have the firepower. Purdue has the firepower. Houston didn't have the firepower, in my opinion, offensively. Now, maybe they could have made it ugly, and it would have been a low scoring game in the 50s, and maybe Houston would have had a shot if they'd been fully healthy. But I've never fully bought in. I think the top two teams all year long have been UConn and Purdue. And, and you know, we had a few years ago, Baylor and Gonzaga are the best two teams in the country, and we got it. And now I think we're going to get it again. And that's what I want. I'd like, I love the tournament. I love the Cinderella's. I love the upsets, unless my team loses. I, I love all that. But when I get to the national championship or the final four, I want to see... I want to see some of the best teams. And last year, I didn't feel that way. Florida Atlantic got, was, got hot. San Diego State caught some right matchups, and Creighton should have beat them. It seems like every time UConn wins the Final Four, it's a jug, it's a whole bu- a myriad of a whole bunch of weird higher seeds. It just seems to be that way. And last year's Final Four, to me, wasn't anything special at all. It was cool you had... Like, I think it's okay to have a Cinderella there. Like, I, I think it's cool NC State's there. But I don't need, you know, uh, an 8, a 5, and an 11. And a one. 
Yeah. You know, I, I'm okay with a few ones and twos and then the underdog. I'm cool with a four, two ones and 11. I'm cool with this field. Way more so than last year when UConn was a four, I believe, and won it all. And there was no ones I don't even think made the, the final four I last year. I believe so. And you had, what was it? Florida Atlantic was, what were they, eight or a nine? Or, I don't know. They were they, nine, I believe. Yeah. I, I don't know. They beat K State in, yeah. uh, in the lead eight. So. Yeah. So, so this to me is a more, it's a sexier final four. And there's the, you got some great storylines. You got Alabama with their analytics, and they actually hire a third party to break down being efficient. They're one of the best offenses in the country. You've got UConn, the whole plot of going back to back. Nobody's done it since Florida in 07 08. You got the Purdue going from horrible heartache of being upset, one of the biggest upsets in tournament history to a 16 a year ago to now maybe winning it all. And then you got the Cinderella slipper, and that's NC State. And remember in 1983, they won it all. At Cinderella. Yeah. And they were a higher seed that year, by the way, than 11. So it there's all kinds of subplots and storylines. I think this Final Four is way better than last year's. And if UConn in, does indeed cut down the nets and they go back-to-back, back, all you can come back at me and say, I told you so. I'm, I, I'm just saying I played the odds all the way through for the whole tournament, and the odds still apply. Now, the odds have shrunk to more like my odds aren't as good as they were before the tournament that UConn's not going to win it because now we're down to four teams but my odds are still better than UConn winning it analytically now some people be like no they're not they just won they went on a 30 nothing run weren't you watching yeah I watched (laughs) that's great and all I don't think they're doing that in the uh, final four I don't think they're doing that against Purdue I don't think they're doing that against Alabama will they blow out Alabama very possible could they blow out the next two games and, and, and cruise? Very possible. But usually, okay, let me stress here, usually, usually to win a championship, you have to have one tough game. UConn hasn't even had it. And more than likely, it's coming in Phoenix. And how's UConn going to handle that tough, tight game? Maybe they won't have to. There's a handful of teams in the tournament. UNC one year, won by double digits every year. I always go to the Villanova one when they beat yeah. KU in the Final they Four. Rolled. I mean, they won every game by double digits, yeah. and right. none was closer than 13. Yeah. And, and I remember saying, you know, hey, they're probably going to have a close one. The odds are in my favor of both of my arguments. It doesn't yeah. mean that that's going to happen. It's just that the odds are in my favor. But those odds are shrinking to where it starts to shift towards people that pick UConn to win it all. Um, so we'll see what happens, but the uh, Alabama-UConn game will be the late game on Saturday, 749 championship on Monday. On the women's side of things, the uh, half of the Final Four set, top seed South Carolina, who blew a 22-point lead against Indiana in the Sweet 16, nearly lost. They're undefeated. They beat Oregon State in a regional final yesterday afternoon. And Texas, a one seed, uh, last Big 12 team remaining. They got knocked out by a three seed NC State. So NC State women are going to Final Four, and then State men are in the Final Four. Hello. Yeah. Uh, the final two spots in women's Final Four will be claimed tonight. It's a rematch of last year's national championship. It's number one seed Iowa versus number three seed LSU. And that's a 6 o'clock ESPN. The ratings will be outstanding and amazing for that game. And then following that game, it'll be a regional final out west between USC, the one seed, and UConn, the three seed. Um, you know, UConn is not quite as good as they have been, but they're in Elite Eight again, and, and you, you know that they got the experience when it comes to coaching in these types of games. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are going to take LSU and UConn to win these games. I think that's what's going to happen, and those are the lower seeds. And LSU beat Iowa in the national championship game a year ago. Who are you taking, Iowa I'm or LSU? I'm taking Iowa and USC. I mean, you're talking about people picking LSU, UConn. I'm, I'm t- the other way. You're taking Iowa over LSU? Yeah. Why? Uh, I, I was I was Kate, not as good as last year. No, they're not. Um, I think that Caitlin Clark's going to be zoned in for this game, and I think that Iowa as well will be zoned in for this game because of what happened last year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's more of a gut thing, mm-hmm. but they also are a one seed and LSU's a three, so technically seed line they'd be they'd be the team that should win. But I I don't I just I feel like they're going to be ready for this one. Well, I've seen them both play. I'm guessing you've seen them both yeah. play. Yeah, LSU's the more athletic team. They're the more sure. com- they're the more complete team. They are. They're the more complete team. They're they're better. From no, one, there's no doubt about they're that. They're better from yeah. one to five. So you can sit here and say, well, I was a higher seed, so that's why you should pick them. Well, also LSU had Angel Reese. She missed like four or five games for whatever the heck was going on there. They had another player that had been suspended. They they didn't have their full allotment of players all year long. Iowa has. And yeah. now, now, granted, they had to make the adjustment with their big graduating last year, and that took them some time. I, I think you know the, Iowa has the best player, but LSU has the best team. 
And so I'm not caught up in the seed line at all. And watching the two teams play so far, Iowa had a scare against West Virginia that if and the fish hitting did seem pretty one sided in that one. Yeah. And then they looked great against Colorado. I thought Colorado might have a chance of knocking them off. And then LSU survived a big time scare against UCLA, but UCLA is legitimate, no doubt. So I you know, I'm cheering for Iowa to win. And I think uh, the TV execs wouldn't mind Caitlin Clark continuing all the way to the Final Four and make it to the title game, have a rematch against South Carolina. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Um, who they upset last year in the Final Four. Mm-hmm. And I think Don Steele in South Carolina is going to have something for Caitlin Clark in Iowa. That's just I, I have a bet with a friend of mine. Yeah, I, I, hope have, he doesn't, it, it, I hope he doesn't forget. I, but was, I yeah. he took he took he took Iowa. I said I'll take the field, but I'll, but then we came down to South Carolina. I said, I'll, listen, I'll take South Carolina any day when somebody is good offensively and defensively, and Iowa's just good offense. I'm not, now, granted, Iowa's been better in the tournament. I'll take South Carolina. So that'd be a heck of a matchup again, too. And I would feel much like I do about Iowa against LSU with South Carolina against Iowa. It's like mm-hmm. this team's not lost a game this year, and they this is who they want. This, yeah. this is the payback that they want. Right. And that South Carolina team is oh, yeah. obviously better than Iowa right now. I mean, yeah. they're, yeah, they're I better so. than everybody right now. Oh, I agree. They've had some challenges, too. But In the end, they took the foot off the gas. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And then USC-UConn, you know, I think people pick UConn because of their name. Yeah. That's why I meant by that. Uh, I mean, USC is very, very talented, and Juju Watkins is saying player, but UConn's got some stars, too. <laughs> like oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. I, I, I tell you, if I had to pick this one, I would, and I'm cheering for Iowa and USC, but I'm picking UConn and LSU to win. So those are my picks. We'll see what happens. I don't have a bracket, so I can win money doing the women's. Yeah, games, exactly. Yeah. And so Dusty and I are opposites on that. And I, I, it's okay for us to be different because then we can brag on the, yourself if you win, and if not, you hide in. I go hide in the bathroom when I don't do well. That's what <laughs> I do here on these projections. Um, let's see. Uh, when we oh, I, I, I share this with people. This is insane. Shortly before tip-off of number three seed NC State's women's win over one seed Texas in a regional final in Portland yesterday, ESPN reported the three-point line on one end of the court used for the Portland regionals had been painted incorrectly. Both coaches from Texas and NC State agreed to go ahead with the game despite the air in order to prevent any extensive delay. The NCAA was notified that the three-point lines on the court at Moda Center in Portland, which is where the Trailblazers play, are not the same distance. The two head coaches were made aware of the discrepancy, elected to play a complete game on the court as is, rather than correcting the court and delaying the game. The court will be corrected before tomorrow's game in Portland. Here's the funny thing. I, the first thing I thought of is like, it had to be wrong for the other games too. And it was. Yeah. How does nobody notice this? Like, and I wasn't watching on TV, but then I see the still shot. You see the picture. How do you not notice wow, that? Dude. With the with the bl- <laughs> how does nobody from a TV network or a wide camera shot? How does nobody on earth realize that until the Elite Eight game? I it mean, is insane to me. That's the fifth game that's been played in Portland by the time they get to the Elite Eight game because there's two Sweet Sixteen games in each regional that had to be played. Right, and so. But right before the regional final of your first regional, you're going to figure this out. Right. It doesn't make any sense. And it's it's pretty obvious, too. It is. Like, I wasn't watching those games either because I was doing other things or I was watching the men's game at, at this point in time. And I just I didn't just didn't happen to catch any of the games that were played in Portland. And I'm looking and saw the picture. I was like, how? How do you not see that? Like, it's, my oldest it's son says obvious. it's pretty obvious. Yeah. I don't know either. And what's interesting, too, is then they went ahead and decided to move on with the game because, you know, one – one half, you're going to have the advantage of being closer on three point line, and then the other, you'll flip in. So, and so Vic Schaefer, who's the head coach of Texas women, he said, and I quote, they gave us the option of bringing someone in and remarking the three point line, which would have taken about an hour, and we might have lost our window with ABC, or we could play it out. NC State's coach Wes Moore wanted to play, and we played. I wasn't going to be the guy to go, I don't want to do it. So, you want to know if I think it had anything to do with the game? Probably not. I really would have loved to have done what I normally do my last 12 minutes for a game instead of walking around trying to see if the floor screwed up, <laughs> which is what they fair. did. That's a fair point. really is. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the three-point line is 22 feet, one and three-quarter inches for the women, and it was not that way on both ends. Um, let's see here. Yeah. And so that does change your percentages, clearly, when it's further back. And so NC State ended up winning. 
and they both were aware of the issue. That's the good thing. And they, it's not like you're you're only going one way in a game. That's like what both I said of earlier, them are able to, Yeah, and I just it's like both of them are able to I just wanted to add to that point. Like both of them are able to shoot right. on on each side, right? It's not it, it's not an unfair advantage for one team because we have like some covid rules where you're not switching sides. And people say that a little bit and I understand it and I do get it. I thought the same <clears throat> thing immediately too. However, if you're a three-point shooting team and you go off in the first half and you're up by 20 and you've made 10 threes because you're a little bit closer, that's hard to overcome just because you switched ends and now we got the shorter line. But technically you have as much time with the shorter line. Yeah. But anyway, because sometimes you get behind and then it's Mount Hill. It's, it's a mountain to climb all game long and you can't quite go over the hump. We've seen that with many teams in the mm-hmm. tournament. So that's, uh, that's a bit of a controversy. There's also another controversy a lot of people are overlooking. And, and granted, some teams have shot the ball well from three-point land in the NCAA tournament, but there's, there's been some really bad three-point performances. Tennessee was 3 of 25 and won a game. Texas was 5 of 25 and lost by a four. Uh, Marquette was 4 of 31. And there's a UConn player that's come on a podcast, and he's confirmed to people what some people have been talking about, that the basketballs for the NCAA men's tournament are overinflated. And it's leading to poor three-point shooting. And this player says, there's no doubt the ball's different. Mm-hmm. The thing is, we don't speak up because we don't want people to think we're making excuses because we don't shoot it well. What the hell are we doing here? We got <sighs> three-point lines marked wrong in a women's tournament for the Elite Eight, and we got overinflated basketballs. What's the point of having overinflated basketballs? You want worse shooting? Wouldn't you want better shooting? Yeah. I, I don't understand these things. And they're all tied to guess who? The NCAA. Yeah, I I I wouldn't know why you're doing the thing with the basketball. I mean, obviously the the three point line is an error that somebody missed. Yes, which I don't still don't. Not just somebody. I still don't. Everybody that yeah, was exactly. there missed it. Yeah, I still don't know how that happens. The, the thing that the, the reason that I don't understand how that happens is these are all custom courts. Like yes. this is not a court that's just been sitting around there right. for a while. Right. It's like wouldn't you like have all that checked out oh, you before to. you place it Make down sure the free on throw the floor? Lines, everything. Yeah, like before it's all placed for good on the floor. Maybe you make sure that oh, we need to add a couple more inches to this three point line. Did they just get confused and go, oh, it's a men's tournament, and we did one half, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, we got the men's line here. That's what we're going we're gonna to put on this thing. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's wild stuff. <laughs> it's insane to me. Um, there was a team from Kansas that won a national championship over the weekend. This year belongs to the Barton Cougars. They are the 2024 NJCAA Division I Men's Basketball National Champions. Barton County Community College, they win the national championship uh, down at Hutch. 88-73 is the final. Hutch native Miles Thompson, 27 points, 13 rebounds, a double-double. He'll be highly coveted by some uh, Division I schools, no doubt. And uh, Barton wins the national championship, 36-1. and Had they won a national championship before? No, that was their first. They'd been in one other one before that they played in. They didn't win. I can't remember what year that was. That's pretty good. That's pretty cool. And everybody talks about, oh, KU and K-State, they're really good at basketball. Well, um, you know what? The Jayhawk Conference isn't bad. Barton just won the national championship on the men's side, and now the women of Hutchison uh, the Lady Blue Dragons are in the championship game against Northwest Florida State. Hutch is the number one seed. They're undefeated at 36-0. And that championship game is at Casper, Wyoming on ESPNU tonight at 7 o'clock. So you could have two Kansas teams winning the two national championships, one on the women's side, one on the men's side. And That's it's crazy. I, <laughs> I put the thing on Twitter this weekend. I was like, I, I, as a Colby guy, I can't, I can't actually cheer for Barton publicly. If you, <laughs> if you talked about, if you talked about like the two schools, that was a long time ago. Dustin. It's like if you talked about the two schools that I would not want to win in this conference. It's the two that are trying are to win. Trying to win it. Because Barton already got one. Hutch okay. is actually at the top of my list of. It wow. kind of kind of the teams that I didn't like when I was in school and, and just kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. As far as a rivalry, we had good teams when I was in Colby, which yeah. has not been the case a lot. Yeah, but, okay. but it's just like, you know, your K-State KU thing. And, yeah, sure. And, you know, I, I, Barton and Hutch are, are on the top of the list. But, again, it is great to see the Jayhawk Conference doing very good things, though. So see, like, you do enjoy that part. It's like we talked one year when Beloit was going to play Ellis and something. Like, well, guess once again, yeah. not cheering for Ellis. <laughs> and what do you have against Ellis? Well, we, we I'm from Watkinney, and our rival was Ellis. And Trigo, <laughs> Watkinney, the Golden Eagles against the Railroaders. Um, so yeah, we still hold that years later. Like, no, we're not going to cheer for him. And then my sister's a trader; she works for us. So you know, there's all kinds of weird things that happen from time to time. You go where the money leads you, right? 
And and like somebody said, well, well, would you would you take a would you take a job with Duke? Would you call a game with Duke if you despise him so much? I go, hell yeah! No, oh, absolutely. The money, yeah, but the money still cashes. All right, if the bank still yeah. accepts the check, yeah, I will. Listen. Call me a sellout all yeah. you want. <laughs> my my son said the other day, he's like, well, you go to this game and you and when you go to the game, you you wear their colors, and I'm like, so? He's like, you're a sellout. I said, well, you're a sellout <laughs> if you attend a game that isn't involving your favorite team, aren't you? Well, my buddies like to go to those games. I'm like. But you're still a sellout, aren't you? I go, you pay to get in. He goes, well, actually, I get in free to all those. I'm like, okay, just stop. You're still partially a sellout, whatever. You can call me a sellout. I'll be a sellout. I have no problem taking t- taking checks from other universities, whether it be Duke, Missouri, or whoever it might be, Colorado, Kansas State, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Hell, I'll do an Oklahoma game on Monday and an Oklahoma State game on Tuesday. I'm not beneath that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open to the highest bidder when it comes to those type of things, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I'll I'll be the voice of the Ellis Railroaders if they pay me enough. You know, I'll put on their colors. I might put duct tape over the logo, but I'll I'll wear their colors. Be like Michael Jordan with Adidas, right? Like, <laughs> right. Let's cover that up. But I'm over. here. Yeah, right. I'm I'm all about America, but let's cover up that logo. That's pretty important, right? Uh, coming up in thirty seconds, the uh, Royals won. I'm Elijah at Kiever Brothers Automotive in Beloit. Did you know that we sell tires? We also perform alignments and all the other services that go along with them. We handle all the top brands. Extras like road hazard warranty, complimentary tire rotations, and complimentary tire repairs are available for purchase on most tires. Right now, we are offering $80 off when you buy a set of four. Call or stop by Kiever Brothers Automotive for fast, friendly tire services today. Find us just south of the courthouse in Beloit or on the web at keeverbrothers.com. Not running, and Salvi hits it in the air to left field. It will carry. Back goes Kirilov. Gone for a three-run home run. Salvador Perez got the Royals off to a hot start. A three-run homer yesterday. The Royals, uh, that was one of five home runs for the boys in blue. And that's the first time since 2017 that the Royals have hit five or more home runs at home at Kauffman Stadium. They did uh, hit five home runs, I believe, against the White Sox in Chicago back uh, a few years back. But uh, Brady Singer, outstanding. Seven scoreless innings. He got three hits, ten strikeouts. He got the early lead, 3 nothing on that three-run jack by Salvi. Six more runs in the second. Royals sent 18 batters to the plate in the first two innings combined. That, 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 that means you're going to probably do all right. Uh, Kyle Isbell um, hit a homer. Mikhail Garcia, the second homer of the year. Uh, let's see, Bobby Witt Jr. had a homer in the third. Nelson Velasquez had a home run in the sixth. And uh, Bobby Witt Jr. went three for five on the day. It was a double away from the cycle. As the Royals win easily over the Twins to salvage the final game of the three-game set, the Royals had a one nothing lead, and it was 1-1 going to the ninth in their second game of the year on Saturday, but the bullpen imploded. Will Smith was really bad. Um, here's Matt Couture on getting that win and getting their early lead. Bobby's the one that his swing is the one that kind of started it for me. Like he got on top of that fastball for the base hit. Then he worked a good at bat. Salvi laid off a couple pitches out of the zone. And then I believe that was a changeup that he hit for the home run. And, you know, that shows his power. You know, obviously we know he has power, but that was to get out to a lead today was, was nice, you know, based on how we had not scored the last two days. No, no doubt about it. I mean, it's the second straight year the Royals struggle scoring. They had they got shut out the first two games of the year last year, and this year they had one run in the first game, and they scored one run in the second game, and then they explode for eleven yesterday. They win eleven to nothing, and every time I see eleven nothing baseball game, I immediately think. And uh, Cardinal fans, you can Cardinal fans, you can you can just suck on it. Um, uh, nineteen eighty five. There was a game called Game Seven, and I believe the final score was eleven to nothing in that one. Yeah, good memories. It's good memories for you. I I don't remember that. Okay, game, no. <laughs> not good memories for Cardinal fans. That's for sure. Cardinal fans are like it was, All good, right. it was a good memory for me uh, as a Royals fan to go back yeah. and watch it. Card- <laughs> yeah, just make me feel older. Uh, Cardinal 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 fans listening are like, "All right, time to shut that station off." But uh, the Royals salvaged the final game of the of the series. They're one and two. They're back at it tonight in Baltimore. Baltimore is off to a two and one start. Michael Waka 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 Waka. Michael Waka makes his major or major league his Royals debut because the Royals are major leaguers he's been playing <laughs> in the minors against Dean Kramer the Orioles first pitch at 535 so how about this for the first three games of the year and it seems like we do this almost every year the pitching's really 
the starting pitching's really good, but the bullpen blew it. The bullpen's been so bad. Imagine if the bullpen had, had – we should have won two out of three, right? Or we should have won five of our first six games, but we're two and four because the bullpen blew three leads. Or we got a gym from Zach Greinke, yeah. and the Royals lost one to nothing or two to one or something like that, right? Well, here we go again. Based on the starting pitching, the Royals should be 3-0. and Cole Reagan, Seth Lugo, Brady Singer combined – the three starters this year, 19 innings pitched, 10 hits allowed, yeah. two runs, two earned runs, five walks, and 23 Ks, and the Royals are 1-2. and two. They should be 2-1 and one at least, if not 3-0. and oh. Sometimes that happens. The bullpen, of course, imploded to cost their second game, and then the offense did nothing in the first two games. But yesterday, they put it all together. So break up the Royals. They're not going to lose again this year. 160-2. Yeah. I revised my prediction. 160-2. That and that and, and you know I I always the beginning of the year I don't like read too much into it because they always you know tell you pitching's ahead of offense usually oh, yeah. at the start of the year but this is kind of the thing I'm talking about with the Royals this year is can the offense do enough with mm-hmm. the pitching that they've gotten to to win games and and again I'm not I'm not saying this right now because I'm not going to panic because right. they had two bad games but then they blew up for eleven so you obviously right. know the offense can do some things and so you got to wait it out and see how this is going to go but we hit late April mm-hmm. and this team's averaging two to three runs a game then you're going to be like okay this might be a problem but you know it's you just you move with it and, and see how it's going to go you got to get at least a home trip and a road trip out of the way mm. to see maybe what you think this team might be and then you got to get at least a month down to see what you think probably this team is unless they get some things changed i'm trying to remember i think it was 40 games but maybe it was 60 i think it was 40 dayton moore always kind of said you have mm-hmm. a you really have no idea what your team's really like until you get through 40 games which yeah. is a quarter of the season the quarter mark and so 40 games would put month, you yeah. would put you in may at some point yeah. so yeah, it's early, and and the good thing is it didn't get swept and start to zero and three, yeah. and you're like, oh god, they're going to start zero and ten, you know. Now they might end up going one and seven to start this year, and and hope just dies on a stick, right? But if they could just like we talked about, twenty five of the thirty eight games to start the year against playoff teams of last year, it's a pretty tough start of the schedule for the Royals. The division obviously is definitely winnable. It's pretty open for the most part. Twins might be the best team in this division. Maybe it's the Tigers. Maybe it's the the Royals. Guardians are trying to reload. So for the White Sox, who knows what they're doing. But, I mean, it is early. And if they could get through these 38 games and be 20 and 18, 19, somewhere around the 500 mark, mm-hmm. it might not set the world on fire. But you didn't bury yourself. And last yeah. year they were 7 and 22 to start the year. So they just, you know, for the Royals fans' sake and for their ownership group's sake, because they want a new ballpark, they, you know, it'd be great for them to get off to a, at least a decent start. Of course, it'd be great if they started nine and zero like they did back in 03, But that's obviously not going to happen. But had they lost yesterday, their three best starters, they would have wasted three great starts. Yeah, like if the offense did nothing yesterday and lost, you know, lost they lost one to nothing. They had had two runs in three games. Everybody thought, "What's wrong with the offense?" Or if the bullpen would have blown it yesterday and wasted Singer's performance, they'd be zero three going into Baltimore, who had won hundred games last year. So that was a huge win. I know it's early in the year, but it's a huge win to get that first one out of the way. You know, we were we were talking in our basketball banquet, our head coach brought this up and I thought it was a really good point. You know, at state, um, you know, everybody's a little bit nervous or they're really amped up. And when Beloit played their first game at state against Topeka Hayden, and we were worried about Hayden, and I know I was for sure, it was like, get off to a good start. And the very first shot that our team took, Noah hit a three at the top of the key from way out there, and he made it. And and then it just kind of relaxes yeah. you because you don't start the first four minutes without getting a bucket, and then all of a sudden you start to tighten up and press a little bit. It kind of loosens you up because you're able to score a bucket, or you had the lead after the first quarter. And so with the with the Royals, at least loosens them up a little bit to go, okay, we got the win out of the way. We, we don't have to worry about this long losing streak to start the year. I, so obviously it's a, it was important to get off the schneid yesterday yeah and just to have the offense do something yeah. is always going to be important when you're in it whether it's at the beginning of the year and you're having a, a tough stretch to start and not getting runs together or if you go through something in the middle of the year and you, yeah. you, you get three games in a row where you've scored a combined one run yeah 
you start pressing yeah you start thinking too much about it and and if you can like kind of slow that down it's kind of like a winning streak right like if you go three games Mm -hmm. and and have success then you start building it and you start feeling good now if you lose you know three games in a row and you've started a losing streak now then you're starting to think too much about Mm -hmm. it and and so you know if you can go like a two game stretch of bad that's fine Mm -hmm. but you start getting three four five games bad in a row that's when things just start to blow up in your face absolutely and, and you it just tails like a 7-22 and 22 start last year for yep. the Royals. Absolutely. But they're getting great starting pitching, and when Brady Singer's your number three guy and Walk is your four, you're feeling a lot better yeah. compared to last year. Only seven of the Royals' opening day roster, only seven players from last year's opening day roster are on this team this year. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we don't run over on it back with those people. That's for sure from last year. Um, some interesting and troubling news to pass along to you to end the show here today. Uh, a six-vehicle car crash on Saturday in Dallas, Texas, has led to a police search for Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver Rasheed Rice, according to Dallas Morning News. The report states that a vehicle believed to be registered or leased to Rice was involved in an accident at 6.20 p.m. local time on Saturday. Dallas police spokeswoman Kristen Lohman explained that the preliminary investigation shows someone in a Chevrolet Corvette and someone in a Lamborghini were speeding in the far left lane when both drivers lost control. The Lamborghini went onto the shoulder and hit the center median wall, causing a chain reaction collision involving four other vehicles. It is not known if Rice was present at the scene, though the police call sheet from the news lists Rice as the suspected driver of the Corvette involved. Police are now searching for the 23-year-old in connection with the accident, but it is unknown if he is facing charges over the crash. Rice was not mentioned in Dallas County jail records as of yesterday morning. The chiefs have not commented on the situation. Two drivers were given medical attention for minor injuries at the crash site. Two others went to the hospital for minor injuries. The individuals in both the Lamborghini and Corvette fled from the scene of the crash, not stopping to provide information or check on the status of the others involved. Rice grew up in Texas in the Fort Worth area, went to college in Dallas at SMU. He was drafted by the Chiefs in the second round of last year's draft and had a very, very good season for the Chiefs and came on late. And the Chiefs, of course, repeated as Super Bowl champions. Okay, so I'll give you an example of how we are in society today. And I hate to pick on my oldest son again, but um, so we were at a family get together in in Topeka um, for Easter, and he, it was Saturday night when he goes, "You see about Rasheed Rice?" And I said, "Yeah." And he goes, he said something or whatever, and 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 I said, "Did you read more than the headline?" He said, "No." And I said, "Maybe you should read the story." Because he just immediately thinks Rasheed Rice is guilty and that he did this and he's fled the scene. And I said, well, first of all, we don't know if he was a driver of that car. Just because it's registered to him doesn't mean he drove it. He could have been the passenger. He could have been the driver. Yes, he could have. Somebody could have stolen his car or somebody else could have driven his car that he loaned it out to. Play People do this. So, and it's a 620 in the evening. So it's not like it was 230 in the morning where everybody's drunk as a skunk. Although technically you could be drunk at 620. Um, and so... We don't have the facts. We don't have the details. And this is what people do in society today. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to the show and you're guilty of it, I implore you to do better. Reading a headline isn't the story. The story is after the headline. But some people have either apparently no time, and that's fine. If you have no, Here's the funny thing I find about that. Well, I didn't have time to read the article. But you had time to paste it on social media, share it with all your friends, and tell everybody what a horrible person this is? Yeah. But you didn't have time to read what would take in 60 seconds to read. I find that comical and sad all at the same time. It wasn't a long article. I read it. And I'm not one to pick on my oldest son. He's just part of what society has become today. Mm-hmm. And that is, we read a headline, and we go, oh my God, did you see this? Did you hear that? Or we see one little snippet of a highlight, and we overreact and don't have the full context of a comment from a coach, a full context of what happened, you know, like I've said before many times, the Centralia basketball game with Hanover. There was no full context to it. Take a clip, throw the worst part to America, and say what a horrible kid this was. Um, that's what we do in society. There's a reason that these... These stories have a headline, but there's also a reason that there's more than the headline for you to read. The sad thing is you don't take the damn time to scroll down to read the story or at least read the first paragraph for crying out loud. And if you would actually read the story and, and, and by the way, there are misleading headlines all the time. And that is on purpose to make you think something or to try to make you read the story. It's clickbait. There, there has been many, many headlines I've seen that absolutely don't even don't even jive with the story. Yeah. 
And that's and that's called irresponsible journalism. And journalism is dying. Let me tell you that right now. It has been dying for a while. For the people that still do great journalism, God bless you. We need more of you. Um, but that's where we are nowadays. We read a headline. We're like, oh, we got all the we got all the oh, we, we have all the information. Well, Terrence Shannon was 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 was, is, was charged in 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 Lawrence. Well, he's guilty of rape. How are they letting him play basketball? Oh, yeah. Let's read on down the story. Well, he says he's innocent. There's a thing called innocent until proven guilty. And then the, the next court date or whatever it is, is going to be in May. They bump this back and so forth. And we have found out, and I just read this the other day, that a guy that was accused of uh, raping somebody, he served six years in prison. And then there's DNA testing. And then the woman that accused him came out after six years. This guy was in prison and admitted that it was a bull crap story. Now, how does a man go to prison when somebody just lied? Yeah. Don't you need evidence? So maybe even with juries, we don't even have this anymore. Or we don't have a good enough defense team to protect us from going to jail, which is what probably happened. Yeah. And so what's the repercussions for that woman? Shouldn't she go to jail for six years? I think so. I think so. Well, you can go to jail for six years for lying. Well, apparently you can go to jail for six years because somebody lied and you believe it to be true. Like, let's not convict people before they have a right to present themselves and defend themselves. I'm not saying Terrence Shannon is innocent or guilty. What I'm telling you is he is innocent till proven guilty. You're supposed to be proven guilty. Okay? So if he's proven guilty in May, June, July, or or whatever, then you know what? He's not going to be drafted. He's going to probably go go to jail, more than likely, so forth and so on. And people are going to go back, and they're going to say what? Should have never played for Illinois. Should have never been allowed to re be reinstated. That was how convenient was that? However, if you don't let him play and take away his last year in college, you take away the chance for him to make a lot of money that he's worked hard to probably get to and be a great player, and these are false allegations, and they're not true, or something was consensual, and you find out that that is the fact, you know what people will come back with? See, you took away his career when he should have still been playing. Well, guess what? He should still play, in my opinion, because he's innocent till proven guilty. Okay, now, if you have a whole bunch of facts that you your school has, has grabbed, that you truly believe are true, okay, or you've got some great sources, then perhaps you go ahead and you say, all right, Terrence Shannon, we're not going to reinstate him, okay? We know in our own scope of things that this isn't going to end well. For instance, Arteria Morris with Kansas, right? Kansas apparently has some information that felt pretty clear that they need to dismiss the man. Okay? Now, has he been proven guilty of rape? No. No. He is not. Terrence Shannon is a different situation. Every dif- every situation is different. Now, getting back to Rasheed Rice, he's not been accused of rape. He's not being alleged to have done anything yet. It's just that his car, he's a registered owner of one of the cars in what appears to be a street racing situation at 6.20 in the evening out in Fort Worth or Dallas. We do not know if he was in the car. We do not know if he was a passenger. We don't know if he was passed out drunk. We don't know if he was driving drunk. We don't know if he was in the car. We don't know if it was stolen. And yet everybody just reads a headline and they go, oh my God, the Chiefs are screwed because Rishi Rice is going to jail. Secondly, you don't read the story to understand that nobody was killed in this accident. Now, now, I get it. <clears throat> Just because somebody wasn't killed doesn't mean you didn't do something wrong and broke the law. I get it. But if, let me stress this, if Rishi Rice was the driver of the Corvette or whoever the drivers were that drove and did the street racing stuff at 6.20 in the evening that lost control and caused a multi-car accident... They're lucky as hell nobody died. Because then you'll be Henry Ruggs. Yeah. Where your career is done, you're convicted, and you go to jail. And if you don't know who Henry Ruggs is, he had been intoxicated, and he did street racing at like 1, 2 in the morning in Vegas, and killed, what was it, killed two people? I know it was a mom he killed. Yeah. And a dog, and I, I don't know what other people were hurt. But anyway, the bottom line is Henry Hug, Ruggs lost his career and lost everything, because he... I think was inebriated and all that, if I remember the story correctly. But he was proven guilty of of racing, okay? And here's the thing that I come to. And let me stress this again. If. If Rishi Rice was a driver and he was doing what they say this was happening. When will people learn, right? Like, didn't you not know what happened to Henry Ruggs? And you're lucky that nobody died in this accident, or you could very well be in a jail cell next to Henry Ruggs. But here's the thing. 
And I, I use this and I share this with my oldest son. I said, you know, I know you and some of your friends probably drive faster than you should in some situations, okay? And I, I remember that. I was in high school and college. You know what? We, we tested how fast the car would go. I ain't going to lie. Okay? I broke the law driving. I guarantee you I drove 100 at one point somewhere, somehow with a vehicle. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you. Um, and you may say, well, that's, your goodness, you know what happened to uh, one of their classmates who uh, that almost died in a car accident, and then we know what happened to a, uh, a young man that died in a car accident, uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, and so forth and so on, right? Like, why wouldn't you learn? Well, first of all, I don't, some people say kids think they're invincible, or young people think they're invincible, and by the way, Rasheed Rice is only 23, so he's a young person. People think they're invincible. And what my oldest son said when I brought this up to him the other day was he said, I don't think it's necessarily that. I think it's just that you don't care. I go, what? Like, I think you're just in the moment. You're just in the moment. I would have been a you're, part of that and for I, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I thought my son made a good point. And I'm yeah. not saying you know, going out and hot rodding is the right thing to do and risk people's lives going 130 on, on Highway 24 or anything like that. But I thought that was interesting because most people will say, well, you're, you think usually the parents or older people are like, well, kids just think they're invincible. Nothing can happen to them. No, I, th- I think he made, I thought my oldest son made a very good point, kind of put me in check a little bit, is that it's not necessarily that we think we're invincible, that nothing bad can happen to us. It's that at the moment, we don't care. We're having fun. We're enjoying ourselves. And I would imagine, and this is not to make an excuse for these two drivers in this situation or for Henry Ruggs either, but in the moment, they're not worried about the consequences, okay? They're not, they're just going, I'm racing a good buddy of mine, and, and I'm going to have the faster car, and we bet 100 bucks, or who knows what they bet on it. Maybe they didn't bet at all. It's just bragger's rights. And that could have easily been how, I got a Lamborghini, I've got a Corvette. You know what? I think this thing can go faster in 4.4 seconds. I can, in four seconds, or it can go zero to 40 in the, well, let's find out. Well, here's a spot we can go. And the next thing you know, one or both of them lose control in this situation or bumped each other. Who knows? Well, now you're not on a racetrack that's, yeah. you know, excluding regular people driving. You are on a regular highway or road where other people are just minding their own business, trying to live their life and obeying the speed limit and, and then get killed or hurt or their cars wiped out because you had to have your fun. So I understand the perspectives, and I thought that was an interesting point. It's not that they the think it's invincible or we think we're invincible. It's that at the moment, we just don't care. We're just having a good time. And isn't that what happens when people get behind the wheel drunk or high? They feel good. Yeah. They don't care about the consequence at the time. Like, well, I can't believe that person would get behind the wheel. They're a pretty smart person. Well, first of all, you don't think clearly when you're intoxicated. You don't. When you're high, you don't think clearly either. Or if you're under the influence of anything, prescription drugs, you're, you're not thinking clearly. So you're not going to think out all of the consequences. Now, hopefully, you're smart enough to where when you had a few drinks, you realize I'm going and trending this way. I better have a B, plan B. I better have a friend ready to pick me up. Or I better have an Uber or a taxi. Or, what, or I'm going to crash at somebody's house. Or whatever it may be. Hopefully you can think about that before you get so out of the world inebriated or high or whatever it might be to where you're not thinking clearly. You at least have set it up to be where you can cover your bases if you go too far, right? In this situation, you don't have time to do this. These guys are racing. So as me and Leah go from zero to 120 or however fast they're going, there isn't all of a sudden, well, what happens if this goes wrong? Oh, well, maybe at the last minute they take off the foot off the gas pedal and luckily nothing happens. But... There's not a plan B in this situation. It's we survive this thing and nothing bad happens or something bad happens. Yeah. Or we get pulled over. One of those three things probably. <clears throat> and so these are young people that were probably having a really good time racing. I ain't going to lie to you. I raced before. Uh, not nearly that fast. I didn't have a car to go that fast. But I, I, I raced against a buddy of mine one time. So... But we don't know for sure Rasheed Rice was involved, other than his car, one of the cars, the Corvette, is registered to him. That's all we know right now. So for people to jump to conclusions and say, Rasheed Rice is an idiot, didn't he understand anything from Henry Ruggs? Well, first of all, Rasheed Rice is not Henry Ruggs. No. And these people that are similar ages, and athletes even older or younger than Henry Ruggs, they don't care. Honest, it sounds sad, but they really don't care what happened to Henry Ruggs because they're like, well, one, it's probably not going to happen to me. Two, I can drive better. Three, I'm not inebriated. He was. You know, I mean, you can make all kinds of things to rationalize why you do what you do. 
You can, I mean, in anything, I can, I can read all the stories I want about stuff that happened to somebody because they were doing the wrong thing while they were driving, right? Right. Texting. <clears throat> but does it make whatever. me stop doing it until something happens to me? There's a lot of people that no, it doesn't. Like right. I, if I see it, I'm like, oh, well, that's sad for them, but it's not going to happen to me. How many times do, do people say that in their life? Mm -hmm. Sad that that happened to them. That'll never happen to me. Mm -hmm. And so. Bad break, <clears throat> but that's not yeah. going to happen to me. I'll take it back to when I was in high school and in that age, right? I, I didn't race. I didn't, you know, I wasn't driving around with a lot of buddies, really. I was just out on the farm, you know, out in the country driving. M most of the time would have been my driving. I really didn't go into town and drag Maine like some of the people did and all that stuff, right? But I can remember <clears throat> there was a, a road, a country road that was, it didn't have a lot of loose sand and dirt. It was pretty well packed and pretty smooth, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm going to see what I can do here. Did, and, and it was sure. it was one of, one of the things like what your son was saying. It's like I don't care right now. I'm just going to yeah. do it. Yeah. And so I didn't get to triple digits, but I did get to 90 mm -hmm. on a on a country road just driving. Right. It was 101. Dusty's like, <clears throat> yeah. I, I've been <laughs> I've been to triple digits at uh, three o'clock in the morning on a highway. Well, that's um, scary. When nobody was out there like that's why it was like i don't care because absolutely nobody else was on that highway at the time and well, i was not intoxicated or anything i was just out there driving it was late night i just wanted to get home and uh just tested the limits but back to the story like this happens on on the county road you know i'll push it up to 90 at, at that time i didn't have it in me to go past a uh, hundred right so I, I pushed her to 90 and everything was fine it was a fun ride you know mm -hmm. I, nothing happened mm -hmm. i hit the brakes and gradually got it back down to 55 which is what i typically drove on a dirt road unless it was marked otherwise and or 45 to 55 but i'd say maybe a year and a half later i'm driving to school mm -hmm. and i'm going 45 and the legit accident happens right i'm mm -hmm. driving the sun's right in my eyes i can't see i hit a culvert and a, and a sand ridge over on one side and then knocks me over to the culvert on the other side i hit that go back to the other side i roll roll my vehicle right you think i ever drove 90 again on a dirt road probably not absolutely not and so it's like i didn't care about it when i did it but when something happens to you and you actually do something that and, and i wasn't even doing anything wrong when right. i rolled my car right it was a legit accident i hit a sand ridge and and so because i couldn't see and so but it happened to me mm -hmm. and so my kind of mentality of how i drive on dirt roads changed pretty fast yeah and the risk that I'll take on a dirt road changed pretty fast. Right. And so it, it is. I think that a lot of it is if you've never had anything like that happen to you, you don't really care that it has happened to somebody else. And you don't we don't want you know, you don't want to live your life in fear. Obviously bad things can happen. You don't want to do hide in your room the rest of your life, you know. Uh, but I'll just give you a quick thing. Like I was driving to school and my sister was in the passenger seat in an old piece of crap car that I had because unlike a lot of kids nowadays that get brand new cars. <laughs> Uh, I never did get one, but, uh, anyway, but I had a vehicle to drive. So at least I had that. Some people didn't have that. Um, and, uh, had a blowout tired, blew out. And I was going about 50 on a country road. Luckily I wasn't going 80 or 90. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, now think about that in your situation, you going 90 on a dirt road and your tire blows out. You probably yeah. not here today. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So in your, who knows how many times you would roll that car and that doesn't hurt anybody else. But you possibly could die or something bad happens to you. And, you know, you you made you said something interesting. You said it was just me. So that I didn't have like, I, I, forgive me. You didn't maybe see it in this way. But but, you know, I knew there was nobody around me or whatever. The road else. was open. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but what other people. Here's another thing that people don't think about. Like, well. If something happens, it's no big deal because it's just me and my car, right? Yeah, but if there to help but you? if you but if you die, guess who has to deal with it? You just hurt your entire family, yeah, yeah. because you were selfish enough to say, "Well, I'm going to push the sucker to 100 on a dirt road." And even if you thought about the consequence of something bad happens, you're like, "Ah, whatever." You know, I'll take my chances. Odds are in my favor if you really truly think it out that far, which most people won't anyway. Not in that moment, right? No. But you're you're even though you didn't hurt anybody else, you are hurting a whole bunch of people that love you. Well, yeah, that you lost yeah. because you did something that was the wrong decision. But you know, you can be going out. You know, these guys could be straight racing, and the car the tire blows out. Um, same thing could be happening with anybody. But whether it's a dirt road or uh, asphalt or highway or whatever the case may be, you know, it could be you'd be 130 and then a deer jumps out and it rolls right through the windshield and kills you. There's been things like that have happened, yeah. or not. So, you know, you don't think about all the possible things that could go wrong. You're just in the moment and you do what you do. But unfortunately, when you do things like Henry Ruggs did and people get behind the wheel drunk and people that are high or under the influence and you go out and then you kill another person. 
or do what Brett Reed did and and ruin a girl's life. Yeah. And now he got what was a commu- sentence commuted, which is a joke. Um, those are those are things that once again you live in the moment, but you don't worry about other people. And like you said, in your situation, if you're going really fast by yourself, you're feeling like I didn't bring anybody else into it. It was just me. It's a one car accident if I have an accident. Whereas here, these guys are racing on a regular roadway. They're putting everybody that's just minding their own business in peril. And it is, to an extent, no different than when I'm going to Topeka the other day and I'm going and full disclosure, I go four or five over on I-70 and I have my oldest son saying, you can go eight over and you're fine. I'm like, whatever. You do that. You get a ticket. You can pay for it. It's not on me. (laughs) But I go four or five over. I usually go 80 in the 75 on Interstate 70. That's what I do. Okay. Come get me. So, uh, and everybody else, by the way, because I am one of the slowest people oh, on the I know. Interstate. It's like, it's like, you're like, you feel like you're going too fast and then people are just passing. There's it's people like, well, flying by. There, I got people from Colorado because it's always Colorado or Texas flying by me. And I'm sitting there going, they got to be going 95 or hundred easy. They fly by me. Yeah. And then you, you go to pass somebody and you don't even get over to pass. And then somebody zigzags on the inside lane because they got to get to their destination two seconds sooner. They're putting me and my kids and my wife's life in jeopardy by being a dumbass. That's the best way I'm going to say it. Okay. You're being an idiot. And what? What's it? Is it really worth it? Like, is it really worth for you to get to where you got to go a few seconds earlier to where you zigzag around and so forth and so on? And then you ride my bumper. And if I hit the brakes, you're going to go flying into me. And then I probably can sit here and get you to pay for my damages because you're the idiot that tailgated me down interstate because you couldn't wait for me to get over. You know, that those type of things, you're putting other people's lives in peril because you're an idiot. And that's what some people would say here with these two people driving a Lamborghini and Corvette. Congratulations, you're fun, you're young, yeah. you want to have a good time. Well, go do it somewhere out in the desert, okay? Yeah. But a dirt road on your own. But don't be doing it where there's people, families, kids, whoever it is riding the cars. And this is 6.20 in the evening. I'm not saying it's okay to do it at 2.20 in the morning either. But usually there's a lot less traffic at 2.20 yeah. in the morning than there is at 6.20 in the evening. And so, like I said, these two drivers, whoever they were, are lucky as hell that nobody died. Or they'd face gigantic yeah. charges. And they fled the scene, which ain't going to be good either. That's the, actually the huge problem here. Like, if, if they're there, they're yeah. not really probably going to get... I mean, you know, they might trouble, get a, but... a ticket or a citation for how fast they were driving right. and causing an accident, right? Yeah. But Fleeing the scene. <clears throat> leaving it and all that that comes with that part of it is obviously the wrong thing to do. So you're just adding things on to it now. Mm-hmm. And... That's the problem that, Compounding that, that is here, right? Mm-hmm. Because nobody passed away, luckily. Your problem is that you left, mm-hmm. and now you've left a hit and run. Or you are a hit and run. You know, it's like it's fleeing the scene. You're gone. And now you just made things worse for yourself. We'll see if Rasheed Rice was one of the drivers. Eventually, we'll find out, yeah. and so forth and so on. And, of course, if you're a selfish Chiefs fan, you're like, how's that going to hurt my team? And what you should be thinking is, thank God nobody was killed. The uh, KU men's basketball team picked up its first transfer of the offseason yesterday when former Florida guard Riley Kugel announced he'll join the Jayhawks next year. He's a native of Orlando. He averaged nine points, four rebounds for the Gators last year. Slight uh, downturn after a breakout year as a freshman where he earned some NBA draft attention and SEC All-Freshman honors. He's a 6'5 guard. He leaves Florida. He goes to KU. He picked KU over Houston, UConn, and Arizona. So a huge pickup for Bill Self in Kansas. And uh, they hope to get him going back in the right direction his junior year. And they also are in on a pretty big uh, uh, transfer kid, uh, I think it's Zeke Mayo from South Dakota State. They're one of the four finalists for that kid as well. So as we talked about, Bill Self's roster is going to be, I think, quite a bit different next year. And he's going to load up on some dudes. And he's going to hit this portal hard, really, really hard. And so he's going to get some dudes. Now, whether all these dudes come here for one year and then they're done, who knows. But this roster is going to look vastly different. You know, and Brian Haney brought up the the, 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 the high-touted uh recruit i forgot the kid's name big kid he said he's probably going to play the four and he just assumed dickinson's coming back as the five which i'm like okay which makes sense uh, but he said that kj adams might have to take a, a role as a bench player if i'm kj adams would i transfer if i'm not a starter and everything i've done for this team and this, yeah. if this program if you're telling me and now I'm not a starter that's what Brian infer- actually he came out and said I, yeah it. I heard that I too. couldn't believe I that like, when he told me that mm, I was stunned yeah I was like you're telling me that some freshman's gonna come into the starting lineup and KJ Adams gotta go to the bench he's not gonna start like why would KJ Adams hang around yeah 
I mean, that's, I, I, you know, I, I realize KU's had some some guys in the past make some sacrifices to to be part of that program, right? Yeah, you know, you, you, Mitch Lightfoot would maybe be at the top of that list of things, people that I can think of that were willing to just do yeah. this and, and redshirt like deep yeah. into his career. But but Lightfoot was never a starter. No, he's he wasn't. And it's like you're talking about a guy that started on one yeah. of the best programs in the country, and now you're going to be like, now you can't start anymore. What that's saying is we don't think we're good enough to do what we need to do with you as a starter. Which yeah. It's, you could take it as an insult. Yeah. You and could. You, could. Well, you hope you could that you say, take well, it like Manu team. Ginobili took it right. with the Spurs, You'll right? You come off man. the bench right. and, and we don't lose anything yes. when you come off that's the bench. That's the sell job, yeah. Yeah, and, and so that's how you try to keep him around. Right. But if I'm ah, – it's tougher to do with a young guy than it is a guy that's been a veteran in the NBA that understands how to mm-hmm. win and what you need to do to win. Mm-hmm. Because Manu Ginobili, don't, well, he wasn't doing that right away. He mm-hmm. was doing that deeper into his career when it was like, hey, we're going to be better Absolutely. if you come off the bench because we're not going to miss a beat. And so that's harder to sell on a college kid. I agree. Yeah, that stunned me when Brian told me that. Yeah, I heard that too while I was listening. I was like, oh. Whoa. I didn't know that was going to be a thing. No. I'm like, well, <laughs> I did expect Hunter Dickinson to be back, so I figured that would be a thing. But, but. think about that for a second. If Dickinson comes back, we know Harris is going to come back. Furphy, let's say Furphy goes to the to the NBA. We talked about that the other day. If he goes to the NBA, even if he's ready or not, it doesn't matter what you think if he's ready or not. If he chooses to go, he chooses to go. So Harris is back. Dickinson is back. But if K.J. Adams decides to leave because he's not going to be a starter based on the, the, the scenario that Brian Haney presented, you could have a you, the only two guys that could be back could end up being Harrison Dickinson. And everybody else is off this roster. Yeah, very well could be. I mean, Jackson could he be forced out or he could transfer himself. Now it sounds like Elmalco Jackson wants to stick around. So, uh, and I think he probably would. But if he's yeah. starting on this team next year, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Kansas didn't do enough job yeah. enough job in the portal. Hey, Bill Self didn't do what he said he was going to do. If, exactly. If Elmarco Jackson starting at the beginning of the year, maybe he can earn a spot. I don't know. But they got a Kugel kid now from Florida, so you can put him with Harris, you got Dickinson, if you can convince Adams to stay, or he stays in the starting lineup. Furphy comes back, now you got a pretty good starting five, and Jackson would be a role player, and then you got to fill behind that. And trust me, Bill Self will. State, regional, and national sports talk on your schedule. The Sports Ticket Podcast. Subscribe via Apple, Google, and TuneIn Podcasts or sunflowerstateradio.com.